Yeah, really lovely community here. Yeah, everybody looks out for one another. And the game would be a place to be, mate, I'll tell you now. It'd be pretty dead without the post office. My name's Andrew. I've been in the Gamby for around about 45 years. Along with my wife, we own and run the Gamby Post Office. It's what I do. It's what I've known for so long. Andrew's a really um, nice guy. Always helps you out. It's nice to have a face that we know there. It's a service that I wouldn't want to get rid of. It's a beehive. People just come and go all day long. Yeah, they know they can come and bank, they can do their post, they can do whatever. And it means a lot to the town. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first in our new series, Australia Post Connect webinar series. It's great to have you here today, and we look forward to having a really fruitful morning. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we operate, live and gather, and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Now, um, we're using the ON24 platform, so some will be familiar, some of this will be their first time. So just a couple of quick tips to help you through. Um, firstly, there are a number of widgets on the screen, so please, we're looking forward to questions. So the Q&A widget, please put your questions through. Those questions we can't answer in the time we have today. We will follow up and we'll, we'll post uh, questions on the resources widget after today's event. Now the windows are configurable, there's quite a bit of content in the presentation so you can change the size of the screen so that you can see the content or the speakers as you choose. And uh, there's a feedback uh, survey, we'd love you if you have time, it takes a minute or so at the end, it's the second last widget on your screen just to, to give any feedback. And finally, uh, we will have an on-demand version of this webinar within about 24 hours or so and you will receive an email uh, as, at once that has been published so that you can access it after the event. So welcome again and it's a great time to be having this discussion after an amazing year, a difficult year but one of transformation and we, we've all seen the impact of COVID and how quickly uh, and rapidly digitisation, which has been with us for many years, has risen and risen and accelerated, both at home but also in the workplace. So how we work, how we socialise have fundamentally changed and home has really become the centre of our lives and we, we live there and work there and, and we're getting back to some sort of new normal and all working through what that new normal looks like. Now, for governments and businesses and many of you on this webinar today, that has implications in terms of the, the, the delivery of services, products and services to your customers or to citizens. And there are new expectations from our customers and citizens. So one of the big changes we've seen is a real focus on a flexibility of lifestyle and convenience and insatiable demand for services, both digitally and in person, but I want the service and I want it now. And many people who work from home exclusively through 2020, that was the only way they could get access to services. But this year we're seeing a more flexible workforce model and many of you will be wrestling with the balance between people working from home and people being back in the office. But people are... Uh, consistently more often now prioritising lifestyle outside work and the home becomes a hub. So therefore proximity to the city is becoming less and less of a consideration or a priority. And we've, we've heard the term sea change or tree change and we're seeing uh, that impact play out and people uh, move further away from cities and still be able to get their jobs done but then live their lives in their local communities. And we saw one local community there in the Gamby. And so they don't need to get into the, to their workplace five days a week and therefore can get their work done and, and have a much more flexible lifestyle that's centred around the home. So it's very topical that we're talking about the rise of the 20 minute city today and we'll hear from our guest in a moment. What does it mean? What are those renewed demands and expectations? And the sort of, what, what we're seeing is um, greater uh, impost on infrastructure, resources and services that are conveniently located wherever we choose to live. And so we'll talk a little bit too about what does that mean for business and government services, both the challenges but the opportunities. I mentioned digitisation, so transacting with, with customers digitally is really important. We've seen the massive rise in e-commerce in our business and, and across the country. Partnerships are also really important in terms of service delivery. In the end, what you all want and what we want to see is convenient, fair and inclusive access for all Australians um, and access to all products and services.
And so for Australia Post, um, we look to leverage our national delivery network, the 4,300-odd post offices that we have, but also we've invested heavily in our digital channels so that we can provide services digitally as well. And we want to make sure that we can provide these essential services to communities across the country. And we work with many of you to deliver these services to your customers. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Bernard Salt, renowned author and demographer. He's one of Australia's leading commentators and business analysts. Now, Bernard draws on a, a, a vast range of data sets that he can then interpret and then look at social and cultural change. And he argues that social and cultural change are powerful forces that are reshaping the way we live, the way we work, and even how we form relationships. So I'll now hand over to Bernard to take us through the 20-minute city concept, and then we'll have a chat and take questions from many of you in the next hour or so. So welcome, Bernard. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, and thank you also to Australia Post for the invitation to talk on my favourite topic, and that is the post-COVID world and how Australia and Australians will be changed as a consequence of the coming of the coronavirus. A very simple proposition, and that proposition is that we're going to see the narrative of urban life and regional life change as a consequence of the coronavirus. Now, to walk, walk through or work through the implications of that for business, for government departments, and for the average Australian. Uh, before I get into the mechanics of this, I want to actually start with a big picture perspective because I think this is where most people in business particularly would focus. I want to look at the largest economies on earth in order to ask the question or answer the question, is Australia a good place to invest your youth, your energy, your career, your life over the next 10 years or so? What is the case for Australia? This is a list that was produced by the International Monetary Fund, in fact, uh, published just uh, two weeks ago. And it shows the gross domestic product or the economic output, the income, if you like, of the 15 largest economies on Earth uh, during 2020 and compares that with the, uh, with the preceding year. And your eye will go immediately to number 13. We are barely 25 million people on the Australian continent, but we are the 13th largest economy on Earth. Uh, and, in fact, um, we have overtaken Spain over the last 12 months or so during 2020. Spain, of course, particularly impacted by the, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, the largest economy on Earth, of course, is uh, the US, and uh, China is number two. That is not my point. The point that, I've be, that is behind this chart is that there is no country ranked above Australia on this list, that is 1 to 12, that has a lesser population. We are really rich per capita. When you compare our economy and our population with other nations, and we spend that wealth, in my view, on housing and on lifestyle and on quality of life, and it touches the core of Australian values, and it is that that is changing as a consequence of the coming of the coronavirus. So let me just move on to, uh, to the next slide and uh, show you where the opportunity has been with the, uh, with the coronavirus over the last 12 months or so. We've all seen the headlines of uh, where the pain has been greatest, uh, and there's no doubt there has been significant pain, particularly in travel and tourism and hospitality uh, and the creative arts, of course. But here are four sectors that have gone gangbusters over the last 12 months. As measured by the Australian Bureau of Statistics in employment numbers between February 2020 and February 2021. And um, on the left, you can see uh, logistics, transportation, distribution, warehousing, logistics, where just as consumeristic, materialistic as ever, it goes back to this issue of lifestyle. Uh, we may not be buying the products and services from shops as much as we did previously, but the products need to be stored and distributed, and that is the point. Transportation, distribution, warehousing, logistics, 34,000 net extra store person jobs were created in the last 12 months. Also supply, distribution and procurement managers. And you can see these businesses and the commercial properties that are associated with that in the middle and outer suburbs of Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. Uh, and the argument would be that that would continue to grow uh, into the future and especially as we're going to be focused in the post-COVID world on supply chain security manufacturing and producing stuff for distribution within our capital cities. The second one there is, uh, is technology. And um, 
uh, it's, my, it's my favourite part of this slide. I do have favourite parts of slides. Uh, and it shows the most, the fastest growing job on the Australian continent over the last 12 months. Uh, it is there, it's the second ranking there. And it shows uh, multimedia managers and web page designers increased by almost 300% in their population over the last 12 months. And it kind of makes sense. If your business has gone online because of the coronavirus, what do you do? You say, well, we need to... Uh, we, we need, it's, it's closed. We need to go online. How do we go online? You've got to call a geek. And there were 15,000 extra multimedia managers and web page designers employed over the last uh, 12 months or so. Also software programmers and database analysts and so forth also. And you kind of also expect... Uh, strong growth in health and medical. Pharmacists, of course, another 14,000 coming out of retirement, coming out of family leave, coming out of other parts of the economy, back into health and medical. General practitioners, their population increased by 5,000 over the last 12 months. Kind of expect that as well. And the one on the right, I don't think is really connected into the coronavirus. It's coincidental. Uh, the reason why agriculture and agribusiness is absolutely booming at the moment is because of the drought-busting summer rains that we had in January 2020. And as a consequence, the regions are blooming, they are booming, they are greening. And on top of that, they are attracting professional people coming out of our capital cities, streaming out of our capital cities, uh, taking their job with them. Uh, I've actually invented an acronym to describe these people that are fleeing the city. I call them the VESPAs, the Virus Escapees Seeking Provincial Australia. It's some of my best acronym work right there. So you have sea change, tree change and the VESPA shift combined with the breaking of the drought. How good is that for regional Australia? Uh, so you've got all of these positive elements that are, that are populating the economy, different parts of the cities and regions, driving opportunity uh, going forward that will shape Australia in the early 2020s. Let's, uh, let's move forward and look at uh, beyond workers and look at um, businesses, what businesses have prospered over the last 12 months. Uh, this chart, uh, it's a pyramid which shows the, uh, the number of businesses on the Australian continent operating uh, by employ the number of employees. And at the base of that, you see the sole traders. So these are people that run a business that don't employ anyone, just the owner, the manager of that business. And there's 1.5 million of them on the Australian continent. There's only 13 million workers. 1.5 million work for themselves. And there might be a plumber or electrician or a carpenter or a solicitor or an accountant or an IT geek, whatever it is. But that group actually increased by 55,000 in 12 months to June of last year. And that includes, that includes the first three months of the lockdown. What that shows, it's never the numbers. Numbers are boring. It's the stories behind the numbers. The Australian people are talking to us through this chart and they're saying that the sole traders are irrepressibly confident. You cannot suppress them, even with a global pandemic. What they do, if you look at the second level of the pyramid, you can see micro-businesses employing one to four workers did go backwards. What I think happened is that those micro-businesses shed labour and the owner tumbled down into the sole trainer uh, base, if you like, to operate a bit like a pilot light, waiting for circumstances to improve, and then they go, whoosh, they scale up. The next 12 months is about scale up. And I'll show you slides, just a few slides on, that will show that that's already happening, the scaling up as the irrepressibly entrepreneurial base of the Australian economy starts to scale up uh, with, uh, with workers. You can see the, the opportunities and the directions that are flowing as a consequence of this. Let's move forward and look at... Let's just pretend that the coronavirus... Uh, does not exist. I know it's hard to imagine that. But what is the underlying demographics of Australia uh, for the next five years? In this chart, I show net growth and loss by single year of age for the Australian population between 2021 and 2026. So if you're planning a five-year strategic outlook for your business, this is critical. And your eye will go to that part of the population that is increasing the most, and that is the, the age of 43, there is another 60,000 43-year-olds on the Australian continent 
in five years' time. You could also say that if you are 43 years of age, you are dreadfully common uh, in Australia. Uh, but it's not just 43-year-olds. It's 42, 41, 40, 38, 39... These are the millennials. These are the kids of the baby boom generation that for the last decade have been holed up in their um, hipster apartments, living that cafe lifestyle, eating smashed avocado, apparently. Uh, and, uh, And now life has a way of dragging you through the late 30s and into your early 40s. What happens in your late 30s, early 40s? Well, you kind of partner up. You have one, two, three or more kids... And you've probably had some success, promotions at work, uh, and you're kind of feeling confident you need a bigger house, a bigger uh, household. So uh, you come out of the hipster inner city and you move to the middle and outer suburbs. And that home needs to have a Zoom room as well as three bedrooms and two bathrooms. And you can kind of see that in terms of property values, that property shift to the, su- the suburbs, is my, or you could do the Vespa thing and move to um, one of the regional towns uh, in Australia. This is very important because what we're seeing here is the convergence of a number of factors on the suburbs. So not just the demography, taking the hipsters out into the middle and outer and regional areas, but there is also another shift around work from home, which I'll come to in just a moment. Just prior to that, I want to talk about... Uh, Now, this is actually my favourite slide. I must say, this is my favourite one. It shows gross domestic product change quarter by quarter for Australia for 50 years from 1970 on the left through to the December quarter uh, of last year on the right. And your eye will go immediately to that 7 percentage point decrease for June of last year compared to March of last year. That was the worst of the lockdowns right across the country. That was when we technically went into a recession, March quarter and June quarter of last year. Then have a look at September and December. Remember that whoosh effect where entrepreneurial sole traders start to put on one or two workers and the economy just goes whoosh and we're in the whoosh effect. Um, It's not an acronym, but uh, uh, it explains where we've come from and where we're going. Interestingly, if you go back... See that in time, you see we have not been through a recession since 1991. We've had 29 years of unbroken prosperity. That creates a prosperous nation, of course, but it also creates a culture of expectation. We're kind of no longer satisfied with a caravan holiday to the Coolangatta Caravan Park. We expect a Jetstar holiday to Bali. So we've upped the ante in how we expect to live. Um, even even the Zoom, the humble Zoom call has become a, a, a more uh, sophisticated production over the last six months or so. We're continually looking to improve our quality of life uh, and our interactions is the, uh, is the point. Let's come to the core of the main shift that has been effected by the coming of the coronavirus and it's in the way we work. I've been tracking, uh, uh, tracking the proportion of the workforce working from home through the census for 25 years. This is the results from the 1996 census, and it shows that 5%, or 1 in 20 workers, worked from home in 1996. So it's like pre-dial-up, pre-2, 3, 4, 5G, whatever G we're up to. Of those 5 percentage points of workers that work from home, one full percent was uh, farmers who have to work from home. And it did not change of 5% of the... 2001, 2006, 2011, 2016 censuses. Because the culture was, if you're working from home, you must be watching daytime television or something like that. Along comes the coronavirus 25 years after this, and it all changed. In fact, there were a number of surveys conducted by um, industry associations and uh, property groups and so forth that suggest that maybe 45, even 50% of workers were working from home during the peak of the lockdowns. And you think, well, will that go back to normal? Will it just go back to 5% after the, um, uh, in 2021 and beyond? Because I don't think it will. I think it'll go back to 10% or perhaps even 15%. And the reason why Australians will embrace this way of working, not at 45%, but at 10 or 15%, is because it reaches in and touches Australians on the basis of core values. It delivers a better lifestyle. 
If you asked a millennial, do you really want to live in Penrith or in Cranbourne or in Caboolture and commute an hour into the city centre every day and then back out again and do that for the next 35 years, what will that millennial generation say? They'll say no. There is a better model. And that model involves a hybrid arrangement. It delivers me a better lifestyle. And this is why I have so much faith in the narrative in urban life changing. This is like some bizarre social experiment where workers and workplaces have worked out, actually, there is a better way to organise the narrative of urban life. Then comes the issues of how the home will change, how the suburb will change, how distribution systems will change or are changing. Let's move this forward and look at the way in which the house has changed. Here is the house from the 1950s, the kind of house that I was brought up in. Not the house, but very similar, I will say, and a little later than the 1950s. Um, it's a quarter-acre block, three-bedroom brick veneer, mum and dad, four kids, dad works, mum's a housewife, uh, and two kids, bunk beds per bedroom. That's how it worked in the 1950s. This was a good quality of life for Australians in the 1950s. Barry Humphreys parodied this brilliantly with uh, Edna Everidge. Um, and then, of course, if you wanted to visit that household in the 1950s, you'd go up the pathway onto the porch and then you'd turn right into the lounge room. The lounge room was a modern incarnation of the parlour. The parlour was the good room. There was only one good room back in the 1950s. The good room was where you entertain guests and suitors. Suitors never got near a bedroom back in the 19... Very different today, I can tell you. And off to the side of the silver tea service where you, had, um, you showcased your wealth and your prosperity in the good room. 70 years later, here is how we live today and here is how it's been changed by the coming of the coronavirus. This is four bedrooms, not three bedrooms. It's two bathrooms, not one bathroom. It's two income earners, not one income earner. And it's two kids, not four kids. If you were to visit that house, your house, you would go down the entry and the idea is that you, you take your guests right through the house because you want to showcase your wealth and prosperity, basically, that we've accumulated over the last 30 years past the open doors to the bedrooms, which means the bedrooms must now be glimpse perfect. And that has led to the pillowfication of the bedroom over the last decade or so. And then you mill around an island bench, which means the island bench moves up markets. now marble, Calcutta marble in waterfall style. And rising out of the centre of it, will be a silver German gooseneck tap. Tapware is now the new silverware. And, you know, the, the humble back veranda now goes by the name of El Fresco. Which is all very, it's kind of... It's very sophisticated, very cosmopolitan, very much appeals to people obsessed with lifestyle, housing, and uh, cosmopolitan influences, uh, particularly uh, European influences in this, uh, in, in this case. Let's have a look at how this has... But just before we move on to the next slide, I think I could find that house on the right in the suburbs of Melbourne, certainly the suburbs of Sydney. I reckon I could go to the suburbs of Dubbo and find this house. There must be enablers of this house in every one of those places. Bed, bath and table, barbecues galore, Bunnings, Harvey Norman. When do you think... I, uh, open up the newspaper in any, new, any city you're in today, be five, six or seven pages allocated to home adornment, home embellishment, home furnishings, home technology. Uh, we are shifting from a CBD and inner suburbs cafe society focus inwardly and we shop from home, we work from home, we study from home, we are entertained from home. Daryl Kerrigan got this right. Our home is our castle and you can actually see this emerging. We want everything delivered. We don't have to go into the city centre... This is where suburban hubs and Australia Post have a role to play, I think, going forward, as well as a number of other uh, institutions, of course. Here is how Australian cities uh, operated on the left for you know, 100 years, 200 years, in the case of, uh, of Sydney. I call them the fried egg model of, uh, of plan town planning. All of my um, analogies have a food theme, fried eggs and goat's cheese curtain and the smashed avocado. But on the left, you can see maybe Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, for example, and you have the CBD and the inner suburbs where all the cool jobs and the hipsters live and so forth. And then you have the broad, flat, white of suburbia pushing in every direction. And the logic was, up until 2020, you just keep moving suburbia out and you create through trams, trains and automobiles 
the opportunity to go from the city edge to the city centre and then back out again. What are the carbon emissions of that? What is the impact on our mental health? What is the efficiency of that? We never questioned it until the coming of the coronavirus. And then all of a sudden, through this big, bizarre social experiment, we showed that another 10%, perhaps, of workers could work from home quite comfortably. And that prompts the rise of the 20-minute city, which you'll see on the right. Now, I can't claim to have come up with the idea of the 20-minute city. Town planners have been banging on about this for the last 20 years. I think they nicked it from the Paris strategic plan in the year 2000, and I think the 20 minutes was based on arrondissements. We might not have arrondissements. It might be a 30-minute city for us. But the idea here in the post-COVID world is that you would um, work from home or work near home. You would um, shop, you would do your, get your uh, education, you would go get your medical services, everything within the local area, and you might go into the city centre on an as-needs basis, but certainly not on a daily basis. And what that does is it strengthens the depth and range of services on offer or required on offer in your local area. Now, I'm not going to cite examples of particular suburbs, but I think most people from Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth could identify strong regional hubs that would emerge. So if you take 10% of workers out of the CBD and sprinkle them across the suburbs, uh, then that would actually transfer energy and value and a requirement for all of the accoutrement that would formerly be in the CBD would need to be developed in these suburban hubs. And that might be, for example, um, a greater demand for those geeks, those multimedia managers. And I've, I've had this issue uh, you know, over the last 12 months or so. If there's a problem with my uh, laptop and Zoom room <laughs> camera, um, then, in fact, I need to, uh, to call a geek. And that service needs to actually be in a reasonably local area. But there's a whole range of other services as well that are now being delivered to the home. Uh, and this, I'm thinking telehealth uh, as an example. Why would you go to a doctor? Why wouldn't you have that uh, uh, done over a Zoom call of some, you know, not for everything, but for something? This is the point that in the post-COVID world, there will be new distribution systems, new ways of working. The digital world will create a more seamless um, way of making payments, of delivering services, delivering goods, delivering entertainment, delivering the embellishment and adornment of the family home, the family castle. This, to me, is a better model. It's a better model than the fried egg model. It's kinder to our mental health. It reduces our carbon emissions. Every five percentage points, you can lift the proportion of workers working from home. You're taking 600,000 workers out of the daily commute. We can take money that used to be spent on infrastructure and spend it on social engagement, social welfare, strengthening those suburban hubs. Maybe the scope for cultural and arts facilities that tend to focus in and around the CBD and CBD fringe could be replicated uh, in these uh, stronger uh, centres, uh, in fact. And you'll see that uh, my PA, who has uh, done this, has been very clever and put a VESPA uh, community uh, removed from the, uh, from the uh, metropolitan area. So, again, I, I would see this as a Goldilocks zone, maybe up to about 150 kilometres from the CBD. So you might not be in the inner suburbs. You might not be in the middle or outer suburbs. You might be in these lifestyle tree change and sea change communities up to 150 kilometres from the centre of our major capital cities because you do need to get back maybe um, uh, certainly once a week or you know, a couple of times a month or something uh, like that. This is the model of behaviour that I think we'll see uh, going forward. And then uh, just some, uh, some key, key points. We are a rich people, a rich culture. We have a a uh, history of investing in lifestyle. It's very important to us. The reason why we created and invented and celebrated the suburbia that we project to the rest of the, rest of the world through programs like Neighbours is because we have the capacity and the predisposition to pursue lifestyle. Does this work from home model deliver Australians a better lifestyle? And I would say, yes, it does. And that is why this is no flash in the pan. 
is, uh, is, is my point. Um, there are jobs and industries that are absolutely booming. Logistics, transportation, distribution, warehousing, um, uh, digitisation, uh, the entire technology sector, uh, if, you, uh, if you like. Um, and also I would argue that uh, real estate uh, in regional and certainly sea change, tree change areas is also uh, um, uh, being pushed forward. The whole work from home movement has been transformatory, if there is such a word. It's almost like uh, it's not a matter of returning to normal. There has been an inflection point. Been travelling along for maybe 20 or 30 years on the same course and all of a sudden, as a consequence of the coronavirus, we're thinking differently. We're thinking boldly and ambitiously, not about how to get back to normal, but how to actually create a new normal. There is a better way of organising our cities. There is a better way of delivering services than expecting everyone to go from the city edge into the city centre and then back out again. And this is where distribution systems and suburban hubs are, uh, are so important, uh, of course. And uh, uh, this is the, uh, the whole idea that um, new models of behaviour, new ways of delivering services, uh, whether in fact it's entertainment services via Netflix or, or whatever, or whether it's health services via telehealth, or whether in fact there is scope to embellish and improve uh, the range and depth of services that are accessible from a regional hub. If it's a suburban hub or even it's a major suburban or regional town, what is the, the range of services that could be uh, added to that community? And I think that certainly Australia Post has already been moving in this direction. If you look at something like uh, Bank at Post uh, and a range of other services, I think that's very much on trend for this new vision of the post-corona world for uh, most Australians. And with that, I'll pass back to uh, Gary. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Bernard. That was, that was fascinating, and I learned a lot there. I learned about the pillification of the bedroom, which I hadn't heard of before. I can't say with my kids I can leave our bedroom doors open, but <laughs> there's definitely lots of pillows, and it is, it is something that we've invested heavily in our home in the last, in the last 12 months. Um, I can see lots of questions coming in that are, that's great, and we'll get to those in a moment. And one of those that has popped up is one I wanted to ask, which is you've spoken a lot about that, the picture of um, you know, the movement out to the suburbs, and I look in, in, in preparing for today just reading about Plan Melbourne which was yep. developed in 2017 with a 2050 view of what Melbourne looked yep. like. You said town planners have been talking about this for a while but how quick, firstly how quickly can we realise this, how quickly can services and move well, so, that, so that the convenience and the flexibility is there and, what, and the other part of the question is what does the CBD look like then going forward? Well, Plan Melbourne, and um, you know, I often feel that uh, Melbourne's plan is often uh, replicated around the country. And you can actually see the, the plan for Greater Sydney, South East Queensland. You know, I track these things. <laughs> I read town planning documents. And the 20-minute the city is there already. But the thinking was that businesses would relocate from the city centre to a suburban hub, um, or they would just grow in the suburban hubs. Uh, but what has actually happened with the coming of the coronavirus, there is a third way or another way that is where workers can take their job and operate from home. I do think we will see not just people working from home, but we'll see people working near home. Now, if you're 38 or 42, then you've probably got two, three kids at home. You can't be conducting a Zoom call with a client with kids interrupting or whatever. It's, it's hard to concentrate. Uh, so I think we'll see the rise of work near home hubs in these, so you might live in a suburban area, you know, ride a bike or a scooter or drive to a suburban hub and uh, work with your fellow colleagues in a, uh, in a local area. Um, uh, and then, of course, it raises the question of, well, how does the CBD respond to this? Uh, I, I, I don't think that the, the core businesses, you know, if the you know, ASX top 200 businesses can't really be run from a Zoom room in you know, the flash suburbs of Melbourne and Sydney. You kind of need to be in an office with your direct reports, with the ch chairperson of the board and all that sort of thing in the same area. So I don't think it's going to affect you know, the Collins Street or the Sydney Quay or the Eagle Street uh, of, the, of the world, but certainly the, the edge, the consultants, the contractors, the IT people could probably do much of their work from, uh, from home, in fact. It will change the nature of work in the CBD. So the CBD work might be more for 
uh, collaboration and training and auditing and or for uh, for uh, upskilling, if you like. Whereas the work that you're doing from home would be more concentration kind of work. So workers will say, look, I am going to work in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'll work from home Friday, Monday. Bolt that on to the to the weekend. And I will do concentration type work or creative type work at home, but I'm going to do collaborative type of work and training kind of work and client meeting and deal doing. I'll do that in the CBD. So I think we'll see a natural split of the functionality of work where the CBD has its speciality and the suburban hubs and work from home and the Vespa hubs will have their speciality. And I think they can coexist and deliver what Australians want, which is a better quality of life. Right, and we're seeing that in our workplace with there are certain meetings and engagements that are just much more effective face-to-face, -face, but people are finding that balance between being together, being with their work community, which is a community in itself, but also then back in their home community and the flexibility of that concentration work versus creative work. And that's, that's something I, I, was, I shared a story with my team the other day about bumping into two or three people going down to get a coffee and the creative energy that generated around an idea that popped up that we're now following that could not have been replicated yep. virtually as easily. Well, th that's the reality. You do need, uh, you need them both to work in concert so that you get the best out of your workforce and create the best, uh, best opportunities, uh, in fact. So I, I'm quite confident that this, is, this will happen very quickly. Just as an example of how quickly these things can move... Um, you know, in uh, maybe uh, the middle of last year, I discovered the Zoom. I didn't know what a Zoom call was <laughs> until the coming of the coronavirus. And the first ones are very primitive. You know, you'd, you'd sort of do it on your laptop and you'd have the camera shining up into your face like that. What I could not get over through September, October, November, December last year and into this year, there has been the upskilling and uplifting, if you like, of the, of the technology and of the expected skill set of people conducting those meetings. So a Zoom room corporate meeting uh, host is going to have the skills of a Tonight Show host, in my view, very high production values. Once business works out this is a better model, once Australians work out this delivers a better lifestyle, it delivers better prosperity, there is no stopping it. It will move at a rate of knots. Then it becomes a tipping point, if you like. So I'm actually very confident that we will see new technologies, new systems, new distribution methods evolve very quickly uh, in 2021 and, uh, and beyond. Well, I think and in an event like this, which, and there are, for those online, there are people in the room here today that you, you can't see, but it's a hybrid event and the production quality is quite, you know, to, 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 to make it work online, but to communicate face to face is a balance, but we're learning those new skills. I know through COVID, I was doing quite a bit of media to talk about the lockdown and about online shopping growth. And the first few were pretty, you know, they weren't great. Average, the audio, yeah. yes. And with time, the right space, light, camera quality and um, even uh, uh, ring lights to be able to do it from home effectively. Um, and the, the, the TV state, that they were very happy to do them remotely, not to come exactly. to the Exactly. And studio. everyone has these, green, these pot plants. I'd love to know <laughs> if the sales of broadleaf plants have <laughs> skyrocketed. Uh, I've killed about three already, so <laughs> I'm eyeing this one off to take it home. In fact. Well, I don't know if that's plastic or real, but we won't, <laughs> we won't let you anywhere near it, <laughs> if that is the case. So one question I do get asked a lot, and we are grappling with, is how many of these... So, yes... Uh, many planners had anticipated this, yeah. you know, this, this balance between um, working in suburbia, working in a, the 20-minute city. And as you said, I think what's fundamentally changed is that recognition that I'm not just sitting at home mucking around, I'm working. Concentration time, I have the tools and the wherewithal to contribute remotely and then I can be face-to-face -face when I need to be. But um, it, does, it does mean some, some of these trends may go back. So do you think... We, we talk about telehealth... Um, and, so, and, and I've seen reports that suggest some of these trends will revert, some are permanent. What's mm. your perspective on that? So things like telehealth and some of the omni-channel services where people have said, well, I'll, I'll do it remotely. Will they go back? Um, well, um, look, I suppose there might be some examples where people revert to their old ways, if you like, the pre-COVID ways. But for every, every reversion, I reckon there's 10 adaptations. This is the way going forward. And the question that anyone in business or any Australian needs to ask is, is it seamless? Is it frictionless? Does it do the job? Uh, does it deliver Australians more time to themselves? Does it deliver efficiencies? Uh, because our track record as the Australian people is 
give us half a chance, we'll take the lifestyle option every time. If I don't have to buy a second car, if I only need one really good suit, as opposed to three or so, um, if I don't have as much dry cleaning, I can spend that money on me. And I think that that really will appeal to, uh, uh, to uh, ordinary, not ordinary Australia, but to, to middle Australia. The other point is that people said, you know, you won't get a promotion if you don't come back into the, uh, into the city. A lot of people, you know, work is not the be-all and end-all of their existence. Work is what they do in order to support their family. You know, they've got focuses on sport and volunteering and their church and whatever. It's what they do. And if this method of work delivers them a better quality of life, more time with their family, then they'll take that. They're not necessarily there to pursue as much as they can possibly earn. That's not the values, I think, of middle Australia. Right, and you talk, that's a good segue to my, the, something I wanted to ask you, which is that, so, so that for middle Australia, but um, we, we see at Australia Post a percentage of people who don't have access to digital services, whether it's economically from an educational, you know, demographic perspective, just don't, don't have access. And a, a survey we did a couple of years ago uh, told us, and it's now, I suspect, well out of date, but 78% of the respondees, there were certain services they wanted to transact face-to-face. -face. So that whether it's just, I don't yeah. have the wherewithal digitally or not, how do we make sure all are included? Because it's something that I know is um, yeah. vexes governments around citizen inclusion for all all citizens. Yeah, it's a great uh, it's a great tendency for people to say, well, everyone is just like us, you know, <laughs> of iPhones and uh, digitally literate and so forth. But the reality is that we're going to see a far greater proportion of the community aged over 65 and even over 75 and 80 uh, over the next uh, five or ten years or so. And typically people in the older age groups are not as as connected, certainly with new technology as it evolves. So the payment systems that they have been used to could change and they haven't kept up with the technology. There needs to be um, a, a way in which um, the shoulder, if you like, of middle Australia, those bits are not, not at the core but off to the side that aren't really connected into the way in which technology is continually evolving, that they can go about their business and um, you know, pay their bills and, uh, and get their services and so forth. And again, I certainly think that there is a role there that Australia Post uh, and maybe other institutions can, uh, can play in that regard. We should not be expecting 25, 26 million people to have the same level of technological proficiency as, uh, as we do for example. Um, and going forward, we need to be more uh, accepting that there's going to be different levels of um, engagement in, um, in this regard. Well, it's interesting because I was out with a colleague visiting a number of post offices in regional Victoria a few weeks ago, and the first post office we walked into, there was someone, I would say, that she was in her 80s um, withdrawing some money using her uh, bank yep. book. <laughs> so the, 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 the licensee was filling in the, the, the balance and so, um, and the, we spoke to the banks about it after observing this and they still, their modelling still suggests 2030 before yeah. bank books, those, those passbooks are gone altogether. So there's still a, there's still a proportion of Australians who, are, who still engage that way for those sort of services. Well, well exactly. I mean, and, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have the, um, the predisposition or, in fact, the will to learn uh, the new team, the, the post, the, you know, the, the passbook works very well for them. Why would they change? They can walk down to the uh, to the to Australia Post and 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 get their service. So, you know, we shouldn't be forcing every Australian into a space that they don't feel comfortable with. There's one thing I think about Australians: we're very very fair-minded. Uh, it might suit us to be all digitally connected and seamless and so forth, uh, but it's not for everyone, and we need to be aware of that. There needs to be systems that 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 collect and gather every Australian uh, to deliver that better quality of life. So, and j just on that note, because I know one of the things that many of the people w uh, listening and watching today would be thinking, because there's many, as you know, g small, medium, large businesses and government agencies, is what does that customer, you know, what does customer experience look like going forward? We've had traditional ways of measuring net promoter score, or, you know, yeah, yeah. and, you know, like it or not, 
we have this device in our hands that's all powerful and we have some expectations from a consumer perspective that businesses and governments are trying to, I guess, step up to and meet. So what, yeah. what's your perspective on customer experience in customer this Customer experience and customer expectations. Ahead? I think, um, you know, I, have, I don't know what they had in this slide, but we've had outrageous expectations. And, and you can see that in, you know, the, the, the sophistication of the Zoom call to the production values that we that we see today. We want things frictionless, we want things seamless, we want things immediately, we want things tracked, we don't be held in abeyance, we want to know where things are, we want a consistency of service delivery and, and once you've got out of the habit of commuting into the city centre for work, well, do I really have to go all that way to go to that um, government department office in order to uh, verify who I am or to get this... Uh, document signed or, or whatever it is. So there's going to be that expectation that maybe not 20 minutes and it might not be 30, it might be 35 minutes, but it isn't going to be an hour in traffic and then finding a park in the city centre. It's just, it's like we, we've had an awakening. Were we really doing that for 30 or 40 years without questioning? There is simply a better model and this idea of strengthening suburban hubs and regional hubs, broadening the range of services and having government departments and Australia Post and others think more laterally about how can we, how can we create a better model for, for urban life in, uh, in Australia. Now, this idea of um, older people, I'm not sure whether I read this in some of the background briefing for uh, Australia Post, that you know, with so many people living by themselves an older age group, is there a possibility that the, the post person can somehow run some, you know, confirmation that they're OK? Uh, oh, welfare check, yeah. Well, so it, welfare check, La Poste yeah. in France and Jersey Post, both have, uh, posties will do welfare checks, which is yeah. a... And they can, they can fill in a template on their device and make sure that they can check skin, yeah, and so, skin tone and just check the wellbeing and, and some social intercourse, the, the opportunity to actually engage alone, someone yeah. who doesn't have any, perhaps any social interaction. Yeah, and then, and then, you know, their son or daughter. I mean, I have a son in Europe and my daughter in America. Um, you know, it's not happening now, but it may well be many, many years into the future. They might not, may, they might wish to check on my welfare. Uh, and so getting, you know, getting that sort of update every, uh, every day would be, uh, would be... I mean, the reality is that going forward, the demography of Australia will change. We will be older and there'll be more people living by themselves. It won't be the most popular form of household, but it'll be the second most popular form of household after, after variation, various variations of the family. So if you're living by yourself and you're elderly and you have a fall or something like that, we need a way to actually manage that going forward and um, Australia Post and others need to be thinking how can we create this better version of society it is not about how can we get back to making as much money as possible the thinking should be what is the kind of Australia what kind of society do we want to re revisit or rebuild it's rebuilding a better version of the Australia we left behind we have faith in Australia but we think that we can actually create a better version of it with welfare checks, with telehealth, with, um, with drones, whatever it is that actually delivers what we want in a more efficient way. That's where and, we want to get to. And we're speaking to the CEOs of one of the big health, the health providers, um, health insurance, but a range of other health services they've been looking for a few years at how they create a, a suite of services in the local area that, uh, that, so that their members can avail themselves of the entire range of services in the local area. Well, again, I think that's very important. Again, if, if you look at the, uh, the future demography of Australia, there's going to be the requirement for not just GP skills but a whole range of um, uh, medical imaging and technology and specialist skills which have tended to cluster in and around the CBD, you know, the... Um, Know, the, the major hospitals and so forth. The reality is that we need some of that skill set, some of that technology to be seeded around the metropolitan area and into the regions in order to deliver uh, the, um, you know, the better quality, of, uh, better quality of life. I actually do uh, quite a bit of work for uh, Bowel Cancer Australia and uh, I've looked at the demography of um, or life expectancy of people who have contracted that uh, disease and there is a difference between regional Australia and metropolitan Australia and the thinking is that you know, there is an element there of having access 
to the services, the technology that needs to actually be developed into uh, the regional areas. So it's not just bowel cancer, a range of other afflictions as well that we need to beef up the technology and service provision in these strategically positioned hubs around Australia. Just, just on that question of regional and, and metro, but then within the major metropolitan cities, do you see differences in, given traffic and, and the, the average commute? Um, that there'll be the rates of change will be different. So if the commute's longer and more <laughs> onerous, that yeah. people will there'll be a quicker move to the work from home and that 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 hybrid than in cities where um, you know the joke in Adelaide is 20 minutes anywhere in Adelaide. Well, I don't know if that's really the case still, but it's easy getting yeah. around is easier. Yeah, well, yes, yes, no. I'm, I'm, I certainly do think this is kind of going to come out of Melbourne and Sydney, particularly Sydney. You know, it's almost impossible in terms of the uh, the traffic and the commute times. Penrith into the CBD is like 55 kilometres, uh, and I'm sure that it's more than an hour uh, on the train. I have no idea what it is uh, uh, in the car. So. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I do think that, um, that it will be faster in our capital cities. However, uh, over the course of the pandemic, I have learned that um, a lot of the public servants in Canberra were actually working from home anyway. So it goes down to the concept of um, does it make deliver me a better lifestyle and does it make a material difference to the quality of output and if the answer is no, it doesn't, in fact, you can deliver a better quality of output from home and then coming into the office maybe one day a week or something like that or two days a week, well, then why wouldn't you do that? It's like we're on this treadmill where we just never questioned the logic of living in the burbs and commuting into the centre and back out again. On a number of levels, that model needs to be questioned and reimagined in the post-COVID world. Now, if you look at what we did when we, you know, with the lockdowns, uh, we actually solved homelessness. The homeless people were put into uh, accommodation. When we focus on something, we can fix it. I don't want to go back to an Australia where they're put back on the street. And if you ask the average Australian, I think they would say exactly the same. So let's be bold, let's be outrageously ambitious for the kind of Australia we want to recreate. This is about what we can all do. Every government department, every client, every Australian, what can you do to create a better, more efficient, more equitable, yeah, more profitable, uh, but more connected Australia in the post-COVID world? This is a rare opportunity to reimagine where we're going or where we want to go in the 2020s. Well, I suspect if we get all those other things right, the equitability and, and um, connectedness, that it will be profitable. But by, by definition, it will be serving the needs of, yeah. um, of Australians. And hopefully COVID has been that circuit breaker from the, um, from the treadmill. Yeah, I mean, th things got to work from a commercial perspective. I get that. Uh, and there are no doubt there are opportunities here, particularly in the suburban hubs and, you know, if, uh, evaluating or evolving new methods of distribution and payment systems and so forth. But again... You know, if you think, look to the values of that next generation, not just do they want to be involved with a corporation or a business or a government department that delivers a service. They want, they want to be involved in something that does good. I think that's the kind of thinking that connects with that next generation. Now, to baby boomers and earlier, it was like, you know, how do we actually make a living? Uh, the next generation, yeah, we do need to make a living, but I kind of want to make a living in a position and with a business that is making a contribution, a social contribution. That, to me, is... Uh, that will create a better Australia. And we're seeing that across our workforce with yeah. Yeah, the, the empl yeah, employees of those generations, yeah. for sure. So I will go to some questions. I have to say, one interesting payment experience on the weekend, I'd switched phones. I hadn't reloaded my Apple Pay. And I didn't take my wallet, and I went to the footy, and I couldn't buy a footy record because they'd only take <laughs> credit card. They won't take cash anymore. <laughs> so that's been a fundamental change from handing the you know yeah. the, the, the guy or girl oh, fifty cents now five dollars um, for a footy record. Um, so, um, so we have you have we have discussed quite a few of these already. Um, so let me just see which ones we haven't answered. Um, so how will so this is from the Damien from the Department of Infrastructure how. Will we use spare capacity in the CBDs? 
Spare capacity in the CBDs, you know, I was very, very bold in one of my very early columns um, suggesting, you know, this was, it was, it's, it's a great time to be a demographer, I can tell you. <laughs> Everything is blue sky and left field. You can be quite lateral about this. And uh, my argument is that, you know, the, the Collins streets of the world, you know, with the ASX top 200, still going to be uh, prime space, but that secondary tertiary space on the, uh, on the edges. You know, if there is a fundamental downward shift in the proportion of workers working in the CBD and there is excess capacity, what would you do with that space? And uh, in this column, very early on, uh, I suggested social housing. Now, this is this idea of, of homelessness. Uh, we can actually create... And you'd, you'd, need to, you'd need to remodel the buildings, of course, uh, to accommodate uh, all of that. But I think there are some, space, there, there are some, some uh, opportunities coming out of this. I, I don't expect that to happen straight away. No board is going to say, yep, that's a good idea, let's do it. This issue has to fester and ferment for a while before people say, yep, that's where we need to be going. But I think that certainly the, the owners of those spare capacity kind of buildings need to be thinking very laterally, very creatively, and getting, getting all sorts of ideas about uh, what we can do to actually deliver a better Australia. And if some of those you know, buildings that might have been in need of an upgrade or something like that, if that can be given over to social housing to accommodate uh, homelessness, well, yes, that meets a need. I'm sure there's a market for that. You know, governments would, would, would get behind that. But also, it makes that social contribution to Australia, uh, which is the right thing to do. So, yes, that's, uh, that's right. the kind of thing that I would say. So one other, I think a good question, which has come from um, Elsie from Hume City Council, is what about the industries we're working from home is not an option? How will they thrive? Yeah. Well, this is, you know, uh, people say, you know, some, you know we'll, we'll go back to work. I, I get that. The majority of people who are working from home, the 45% of the workforce um, that, uh, that were at the peak of the lockdown, you know, maybe, maybe 30 percentage points maybe even 35 percentage points, will actually go back to the workplace. Because there are some jobs that you cannot do from home, that you actually need collaboration, you need supervision, you need whatever it is. Uh, but, but there is a proportion. There is a stratum in the middle there. And I'm saying it's 5 or 10 percentage points that would be added to the base that, uh, that will make a difference. Um, there was a new census this year, it's very exciting, in uh, August of this year, and that question will be asked, um, did you work from home today? And we'll get the results in November 2022. If my prediction is right, and that it's going to be 10 or 15%, you will never hear the end of it. I will talk about it for the rest of my career. If I am wrong, we will never talk of this topic ever again. <laughs> but I am so confident that the Australian heartland is going to say, why was I commuting? I can deliver what I was delivering better from my suburban home. I've got all the technology, got myself set up. This is a better model going forward. No, I, no that's, a, that's a great answer, and we'll hold you to that when the census, okay. when it comes out. Uh, so we've got literally a couple of minutes left, so perhaps one more question. Hi, Bernard. Given the rise of the tree changer and those tree changers keeping existing city jobs, what is the impact on regional skills available? Infrastructure and services need to grow as a regional city population grows, but the skilled labour isn't available. Would love your thoughts on how this can be navigated. That's James from Align Work Health. I actually did quite a bit of work in regional Australia. I was in Armidale, uh, New South Wales, yesterday, and, you know, turn up to Wagga and Dubbo and uh, Albury and wherever. Uh, and the key issue, the key issue is always getting access to professional skilled labour, um, a, a, a sufficiently deep pool of professionally skilled labour in those areas. And if you think about this, this is going to be a major issue over, literally over the next 12 months. The, the hydraulic hose that has delivered skilled labour into the Australian economy and workforce engine has been kinked by the coming of the coronavirus. So all of those skills that we could drag in from the Philippines and from China, from India or whatever, have been kinked. So we, are, we will, will be uh, employing or deploying a greater proportion of locally skilled labour. And if someone turns up to, I don't know, Bathurst or Ballarat uh, or further afield uh, with these professional skill sets, they might have their, their city-based job initially. But, you know, if you're in that town, you see the opportunities, you might start up your own business. 
or you might find, you know, I want to work for the local council or there's a local manufacturing business or something like that, that those skills will actually seep and transfer into the, uh, into the local area. I do think one of the great opportunities and requirements of the next 12 months is upskilling, reskilling, relocating, creating a labour force that's skilled, that's focused and that can, that can move and be agile to pick up the opportunities. That's going to be the real challenge going forward, particularly as the, the borders are likely to remain shut, I think, for the balance of the year. Right. Well, look, thank you, Bernard. It's been fantastic having you today. I know we've got many more questions. As I said at the start, we will answer those and post those on the, on the, on the platform after today's event. But for all of those of you who joined us remotely, thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful uh, hearing from Bernard. Lots of thought, for, lots of um, uh, things to think about, thought-provoking, um, and as we see this change, tree change, sea change, the 20-minute the, the city, there's lots of us to think about going forward. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Gary.